Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scott's Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip and he does, he scores! Oh, what a great back And this week we're joined by journalist, podcaster and former Aberdeen and Darlington goalkeeper David Priest. Thanks for coming on, David. Um, absolute pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you and um, welcome to the show. And is in your honour, I don't know if you, you recognise this style of goalkeeper top that I'm wearing. It's the Jorge Campos. It is, Mexico yeah. type one, yeah. So I was looking at that. It's a nice one, that, isn't it? I've had it since around about nineteen ninety one. So it's you know it's it can be considered nostalgic. So there we go. That's that. That's the problem a bit about being our age now. Yeah, nineties yeah. is nostalgia, isn't it? <laughs> well, that, that that's the thing I, I go on about. It's like there's nothing that drops a heart more than somebody being nostalgic about things that start with two zero zero. You know, it's something to, it's like, that's no nostalgic. It can't be. It can't be. For me, nostalgic is anything 90 backwards. 1990 backwards is nostalgic. Well, the thing for me was always either like playing with lads who were born sort of when I just started my career. But even now, as, as I start coaching, you're starting coaching lads who were in the first team who were, who were born in the 2000s. Oh. It's heartbreaking. It's, oh, it is, honestly. It is. <laughs> So, and you, you like it, and you like to think you've got a bit of I don't know, like a bit of a connection with them, you know, because you're footballers. And but the, now it's that's all that's gone. Yeah, you know. Yeah. When I when I, when I was about thirty year old, and you got lads who were coming in at eighteen, and you can have a bit of crack with them. That's it's a bit different now. There's a big, it's too big a time difference between them now. Too big a gap. But but that must. Be, I mean, I know exactly what you mean, and that must have been the way it was when we were younger. You know, the the music we listened to, and the, the humour we had, probably people who were our age then. Just like, I can't connect with that. I can't connect with that. And now we're exactly the same. Do you know what is uh, the worst thing about it is getting, getting angry about something that's not for you. Do you know what I mean? So like, or, or like the sort of like the modern day culture now, yeah. whether it be songs or what fo- young footballers do, getting angry about it, then just think to yourself, well, it's not for me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's it wasted energy. Mm. It, it still doesn't stop us getting angry. Like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. And, and just looking at Andy's goalkeeper, the top there, David, what, what was your sort of opinion on colourful? you colourful tops or more traditional? What was your preference? I, I absolutely hated those tops. I mean, I mean I've, I've wore some absolute crackers in my time. But um, the best ones that I, I, that I loved was when I was in Silkeborg in, uh, in Denmark because I basically had the... Uh, a different version or different colours of the, what they wore, what the mm. outfield players wore. Yeah. But it was like, I was, there was like red shirt, white shorts, red sh- socks. But I was like either all white or all black. Mm. I, lo- I love that. Yeah. All black or all white. It was beautiful. Yeah. So, so just a bit of background about this. I wore this in the East Fife Saturday League. So you can imagine that it wouldn't have went down particularly well uh, <laughs> some of the little villages and towns and back then. Yeah. Was the was the word funny used? Well, the, the thing is, <laughs> listen, it was, but mostly not for me because I, I was at university there and it was St Andrews and so there was a lot of English people on my team so they mm. got absolute pelters and I thought I've, I've got to show them some solidarity so I'll wear <laughs> the most garish thing I can and try and get some of the flack off of them. But okay, so listen, we're, we're here to look at this shoot magazine from the 30th of October 1982. So we'll do as we, we normally do. We shall firstly get it moving and we'll start with the front cover. And it shows Glenn Hoddle in action for England with the accompanying headline Hoddle Sensation. I was fed up with football. Now he's wearing for me the, the greatest England strip of all time. It's the, the Admiral one with the red and blue bands and the shoulder bit. 
it's it's the most iconic one for me, and I guess it's sort of because 1982 for me was the the greatest World Cup of all time as well. Uh, so what about yourself? What would you say, England strip and greatest World Cup? Well, for me, the the, the greatest England strip was the uh, strip that Peter Shilton won in uh, Mexico '86. The mm -hmm. all silver, the silver one, right, the yeah. sort of navy. Uh, yeah, it was like a navy padding on the shoulders and arms. I absolutely loved that because I got, I must have got that for the Christmas. It must have came out just before the World Cup. So I've got, I've got a picture of myself in the back garden with my new boots on, new Puma boots on, pair of, uh, pair of Royce gloves, and fully decked out in the England strip. I absolutely loved it. The silver shorts were unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. What about the World Cup? Which one would you say was your favourite? Yeah, well, it was 86 for 86 me. I mean, well. you don't look it, but you, you must be just a little bit older than me, are you? I think um, four years. You're 76, are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm Yeah, yeah I'm 72. So it sort of ties in. We keep saying this. It's, it seems to be around about a certain age, 10 or 12, is when yeah. you're, you if the World Cup is around about then, that's usually the one that sticks with you the most. So me for 82, yeah, yeah. But the thing about '86 was it was the um, it was the video that came out afterwards. Hero, you know the one that was narrated by uh, Michael Caine. Mm. Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. Yeah, you need to see it. It, it, it makes it like a, a real spectacle. There's a lot of sort of um, it, it gives it a lot of depth to it, you know, because there was the the uh, the earthquake in Mexico City just mm -hmm. prior to the World Cup, so it starts off with that. And then because of the teams at that time, you know, you've got like the Brazil team, 86 French team, uh, the Italians, West uh, West Germany, you know, it goes through all the groups, Denmark's group. I think they were in Scotland's group. They were in Scotland's group, weren't they? Yeah, 86, yeah. Yeah, or they, or they play, yeah, they played them as well, yeah. When you, the, they in the World Cup? As well. No. Yeah. Scotland had um, 86 was... 86 at Denmark, uh, Uruguay and West Germany. Scotland had... Was it Denmark? Yeah, no, the beat is yeah, yeah, it was definitely yeah, it was definitely Uruguay. Yeah, it was. yeah, and then Denmark slaughtered Uruguay six one. Yeah, that was it, and then they ended up, they ended up getting beat five one off Spain. I, I think. Spain, yeah. yeah. I, I watched that. It's like whole games on YouTube. I watched that not that long ago. Oh, but but even like so, so that video. I, I mean, I watched, must have watched it a thousand times, and then once sort of I didn't have a VHS video player. Then it was brilliant when uh, years later when it, it was on uh, it was on YouTube. Mm. I almost oh, God knows how many times I watched it. <laughs> But and 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 it was from that that that's where I real had a real fascination with uh, with Danish football. Right. right. Michael Loud that that team's incredible team really. I mean, you think of like, from... that your interest in Danish football has last has been for quite a while. It wasn't something that just happened, was it? No, no, that, that was it from 1986, and I sort of Michael Loudrup was one of my favourite players as a kid. Even though, like at that time, you really couldn't see much. You know, you, you mm. probably see them yourselves. You see things on Transworld Sport on a mm. on a Saturday morning, and um, they, they, you couldn't see it a lot. But I was absolutely fascinated with them, and mm. it was just pure luck. Like later down the down the years, that he ended up um, he ended up playing over in Denmark. Obviously, you have a Danish manager at, at Aberdeen mm. and playing with uh, Danish another Danish goalkeeper, Peter Kerr. But um, yeah, and I ended up playing playing against. Um, Michael Loudrup's teams when he was manager of Bromby. Yeah. Uh, so it was, yeah, it, it was just like came full circle to me as now how, how things work out. Mm. Okay. So back to the front cover. So we're looking at it's 30 pence is the, the cover price. And down the bottom, we've also got 12 and a half krona in Denmark, 2000 Italian lira, uh, or it's 60 cents in Australia and New Zealand. A bargain at any price. Other headlines, D-Day in Manchester, and there's a accompanying photo which shows Man United's Brian Robson in f full flight, pursued by Man City's Paul Power. Uh, free inside, four more cards for our top 20 All-Star collection. There's a headline that says Birmingham Star and Bust Up, so that, that's pure clickbait from back then, it doesn't give us any more information <laughs> than that. And Sunderland and Morton Team Group, so I'm sure we'll, we'll spend a bit of time looking through one or two of those. Uh, anything we want to pick out from the front cover? I just think it's a great aesthetic, isn't it? Look at the, the strip, the cut of the strip as well, the, especially the cut of the shorts. Look at them shorts. Mm. Don't leave much of the imagination them, do they? <laughs> no. And uh, you know, it, it helps that Glenn is quite you know muscular there and is filling them out quite well. 
Oh, I mean, he was, he's a good-looking bloke, wasn't he, you know? Yeah. But the, the Bur- well, I just noticed the Birmingham Star bust-up. What year was this? Did you say 82? 82. That could have been at any one of the number of Birmingham <laughs> stars at that time. Yeah. Tony Porton, Mark Dennis. Mark Dennis, yeah. He's a name that springs to mind, too. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if McArthur was there as well. But, the, it, yeah, it wasn't the group. They wanted to call the Birmingham Six. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look inside. And... Um, Pages two and three it says the heading here is it's a shoot view, so it's an ed- editorial bit and it's black ma- magic. So prepare yourself to cringe a wee bit in the next next little bit. So Barry Robson's choice of six black players for his twenty two man England squad to take on West Germany at Wembley is final confirmation that the black revolution has happened. Viv Anderson was the first black player to wear a full England shirt against Czechos- Czechoslovakia in nineteen seventy eight. Laurie Cunningham then got his first cap against Wales six months later. So Robson has named Anderson, Ricky Hill, Cyril Regis, John Barnes, Luther Blissett and Mark Chamberlain in, in his squad. And Robson is said to be clearly excited by the ball wizardry and attacking instincts of the new breed. I mean, it's just like, yeah, I just shudder when I read that. It says, the only group as yet painfully slow to accept the black revolution is a minority section of supporters, in, in quotes, who choose to display their pathetic ignorance by jeering coloured players whenever they touch the ball. Black players are winning international honours by right. They will play a major part in England's football future for years to come. The sooner they are accepted by everyone, the better. Sign of the times, that, isn't it? Uh, that was nice of them, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. To be honest, there's a little bit later on with, uh, is it Phil Neal? No, Phil Thompson, is it? Uh, which is, um, yeah, that pales in comparison to to what we're going to look at later on. So on, on the same two pages is the Glenn Hoddle sensation. So he says, I was fed up with football. And it, it says, behind the misery of Glenn Hoddle's enforced absence from football, soon after the start of the season, lay the story of Hoddle's fear at the months ahead. He lay at home pondering his future with his leg in plaster. Hoddle revealed his feelings at the start of the season. He says, My appetite for the game was not right. I felt mentally stale and physically tired. Now I'm desperate to get back playing again, just as soon as I can. But I didn't feel that way at the beginning of the season. He continues, he says, It was a long season last term, and then we went to the World Cup. By the time that finished, I had only two weeks off. So when we reported back, I wasn't enjoying training or looking forward to matches or anything like that. The English programme is very demanding and I reckon you play more than two seasons worth of matches in this country compared to somewhere like Italy. There's a chance players will find themselves burned out quicker in their careers. That's especially true considering the weather conditions English football has played in. Uh, He he says he felt mentally refreshed after his enforced layoff and also mentioned the fact that he was having some Achilles tendon issues and hopefully the, the layoff would have helped with that. Now, on his England place, he says, all I can hope now is that I get the chance when I'm fit again. Uh, Just as a bit of background, he says, Spurs found Hoddle's injury a cruel blow, especially after losing Argentine midfielder Ozzy Ardiles to PSG, although Hoddle did say that the team showed they could do well enough without both players. I thought it was a bit interesting, his his take on, do we think other countries played as little football, or is it just a lack of maybe... Realising that other countries had all these games on. Oh, I mean, it's something. It, it's an age-old uh, discussion that it, it even goes on now, doesn't it? I mean, I, what, how big was? I wonder how big the uh, the first division was then. Was it 24, 22 uh, clubs? I mean, people always talk about the, the more now the EFL sort of Championship and League One and League Two, and how, how relentless it is. And especially, you know, I, I mean, I, I've just been over in Sweden where. It's there's only thirty games in the season in the league season, hmm. and, and this season because the because the um, the the season was delayed, so we had to condense it. So we were playing sort of Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. People were going off their heads. They couldn't, you know, the players couldn't cope with it. They weren't yeah. used to it. Yeah. You know, they, they just couldn't. I mean, physically, they couldn't cope with it because you know you have to deload players and rest them, and you can't play them two games in a row. But just mentally, they couldn't get their heads around it, like you know. Mm. But it, and it just shows you how far back it goes when they they mentioned that you know, with English football. I mean, it didn't seem to upset them when they went into Europe either, though, did it? Yeah. All these extra games, and they were still dominating Europe as well. So I mean, where the argument comes in there, maybe maybe with the, the downfall of the England of the England team, 
you know, or to the detriment of the England team, then that's when it hits them at the end of the season when they've got to go to tournaments. But mm. yeah, it just shows you how long being taught about. It. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's the thing about well, if you're not going to tournaments, you're not playing in Europe. You'd rather be doing that than not, wouldn't you? So if if you go through these periods where oh, we're not qualifying and you have all this time off, you're probably just going to moan as much about that than you would if you're actually away doing these things. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's it, yeah. I mean, if you're a successful side you're like Man City, Liverpool, or whoever, now you're expected to play 60, 70 games if, you, if you're going to be successful, or well, at least 60 games anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I mean, what do you do? Yeah. So so let's take Glenn, Glenn Hoddle as a player. Um, what, what are your, your thoughts on Glenn? I thought he was a wonderful footballer, absolutely wonderful. I mean, the reason why I thought he was going to, he said he was fed up, was probably because he was sick of the ball going over the top of his head all mm. the time, like you know, and missing them out. I know Spurs played they, maybe he's a bit more of a football inside back then, but yeah, he was an unbelievable footballer, and I, and I think that there's no question about that. Yeah. But uh, I think that the discussion around Glenn always comes around, around sort of him as a coach and what happened to him when he was when he was England manager and. Mm. I'm I'm certainly one who thought that it was probably his, yeah right what happened to him at the time and he's he, he's uh, his his comments were were really sort of off kilter like you know but it's he's definitely somebody who who England could have benef- benefited from sort of in the early two thousands yeah you know after after he'd been out the scene a little while and he was very much the way that he played football the way he thought about football actually fits in the way things have been sort of the last ten years the way things have developed the last ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they could have benefited early, earlier from, you know, you, you've got the likes of um, Sven Joran Eriksson and Fabio Capello who kind of played up to the sort of English stereotype. I think, well, this is the way they play football. Let's make sure that the England team plays exactly the same way. And I've never really, yeah, I've never really pre- prescribed that a lot because it's in the end, when we've started doing what we're doing now, we're just, we just we were just always going to be further back to play catch up. To the, to the rest of the teams and the way football is now because everyone plays in Europe all the top players play in Europe and all the teams are filled with sort of multicultural uh, players it, it, football's become more of a I don't know there's less distinction between sort of stereotypical styles before yeah. you had the South American style the European style you know Southern European style and, but now it's yeah it, it Everything's more like there's a one type of football with with little bits of tweaks around it. Like you know, it's it's a lot more it's a lot easier for people to accommodate going from country to country now. Mm. I remember my, my my dad used to have sort of pubs and clubs so where I grew mm. up in, and then um, so we were probably I was probably one of the the, the first people and sort of amongst my friends to have like the uh, to have satellite TV. Yeah, because they had it in the club and they fed it into the the, the flat where we lived on it, and then. Um, I was remember a Friday afternoon, it was about four o'clock, watching Argentinian football. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was baking hot and the massive crowds, like you know, whether it was Boca Juniors, River Plate. So I remember one one game River Plate, and it was literally played at walking pace. The whole game was played at walk, walking pace until like they got twenty meters from goal, then it was just bang, 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 and it come alive. And it was for, for me, it was just interesting to watch. Thinking, well, that's not the way you play football. Mm-hmm. You know, so it should be 100 miles an hour and, you know, get the ball forward as much as you can, like, you know, but uh, they weren't in a hurry to get the ball forward anyway. I was just thinking, you've got to be careful with those shared um, sky dishes when you're watching it upstairs and you change the channel and somebody comes on. Do you know what? <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's, <laughs> it's funny to say that because the, um, the living room was sort of, uh, the, the wall, the right-hand side wall of the living room was where the, it backed onto the bar mm. so like it, it was um, the, the club that my dad had for the last he had it for about 30 years it was a, um, a, a Buffalo's club you know like a Freemasons right so like you had a bar where there was only men mm-hmm. then you had the lounge where women were allowed and then upstairs you had like the concert room where they had all like the, the act on and then there was another room big room where it was the lodge so every night a different lodge would sit in the uh, in the Buffalo's and like, and, and it'd be nice when I'm, I'm flicking through, and sometimes not by accident, you know, you'd, <laughs> you'd fall, you'd fall on Sat Eins or one of the other the German channels, and like you've got Tutti Fruity on there, where it's like a sort of strip game show, and you come across it, and there'll be, you know, somebody's there's a woman there topless, and all you, I mean, there's about 
must be about 100 people in the uh, in the bar next door and as soon as it goes on it goes goes Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, a, a nice nice little reminder for us that uh, everyone was watching the <laughs> the satellite next door. Well, talking about that, one of the things I've discussed with people, I don't know if I've done it in here, Tom, but I've certainly discussed with other people is growing up, I remember sitting in the living room in the house and it would be like sort of evening time, so darker, and you'd be able to see what other people in the street were watching because the light of the TV in your place changes as scenes move about and you would see that it would change in the same exact same moment with other people <laughs> so you would know that if you had the you know the red triangle stuff on and you could see if somebody else is watching it down the road you know, there's no, no privacy back then i'm telling you <laughs> okay so let's uh, move on to pages four and five um these are short stories so it's over the two pages um we'll pick a few of them out the first one is viv richards and black power and it says, despite Bobby Robson's faith in black power, here's one coloured star you won't see lining up for England. It's Viv Richards, Somerset's West Indian cricketer, who recently skippered a cricketer's 11 against Minehead in aid of his testimonial. And there's a company in photo that shows Viv in the changing room, either doing up or untying his bootlaces. Um, I'd say it's probably post-game, given the, the state of the boots, but who knows, back then. Uh, are you a cricket fan, David? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do like me cricket. I used to like it a lot more when I was younger, when I when I could actually go and watch it. Sort of, especially when uh, it's, Durham first became a first class uh, club because we used to, when I was at Sunderland, we used to get a, a free box to go and watch them. So, but I used to, yeah, I'd go and watch England a few times when I was younger, and yeah, I watch it if it's on, like you know. But I'm not, um, I wouldn't say that I'm a connoisseur of it, you mm. know. Yeah. I mean, I, whenever somebody mentions cricket, I always have to mention the fact that I got a five, five for nineteen in the town cup final from my school, including a hat trick. So, I'm glad you brought that up. Anyway, <laughs> well, I, I'm going to have to Google what that means in the first place. So, yeah, <laughs> Tom, are you, are you... it means I, it means I took five wickets for nineteen runs. Anyway, okay, I'm still I'm still going to have to Google that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the next one is Hamden Super Show. It says Hamden Park could stage a Scotland Italy clash this season with a difference. The Scottish League wants to arrange a game against the Italian League, and that would leave the way clear for the Italians to include names such as uh, Rossi, Conte, Zoff, Gentile, and they could also pick imports such as Trevor Francis, Liam Brady, Joe Jordan, Falcao, Boniek, and Platini. Some names in there. It says their presence would certainly boost the Hamden Gate and prove a real test for the eleven home Scots. Now, t Tom, I don't know if you found anything on this. I didn't find any record of this no. ever happening. I can't be played, no. Yeah. I mean, some great no. names there as well, isn't it? Uh, Boniek, Platini, Falcao. Uh, yeah, Gentile, who's obviously maybe not as cultured uh, a player as, as some of the other ones. But uh, okay, next one: the Toyota Cup boost Villa. So European champions Aston Villa will definitely play in the World Club Cup final in Tokyo on Sunday the 12th of December, even if their opponents are Argentine champions River Plate. Manager Tony Barton says, Aston Villa have no worries about playing a club from Argentina. We could become the first British winners of this cup and start to heal the rift that has existed between our two countries since the Falkland War. Now, I, I have absolutely no idea how Aston Villa beaten River Plate in a cup will heal a rift between the two countries. If anything, that that's going to make things worse, isn't it? Well, I don't think it, whatever happens, I don't think it, it could have done them any good. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. So a, a wee spoiler: it was Penarol of Uruguay that they met and they lost two 0 So unfortunate there. Uh, next one it's, is Holton quits, and this is Jim Holton. So, former Scotland centre-half Jim Holton has decided to quit the game and concentrate on running a public house in Coventry. He had his career shattered by two leg breaks in nine months and never fully recovered. He says, it's best to quit now rather than to keep going in the third or fourth division. I still have 14 months of my contract to run at Sheffield Wednesday, but I had a thin time of last season. I had a couple of offers to go to Australia, but I'm sure I have made the right decision. Jim Holton, I don't know if you remember Jim Holton. Uh, yeah, it doesn't ring a bell. That yeah, he, he he did die young. He died at forty two, uh, so he he did die quite young. But he he had um, fifteen Scotland caps as well, 
He played for Man United, uh, Sunderland, 15 games at Sunderland back in 76, 77. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's, a, there's a song that goes about for Jim Holton. It's a six foot two, eyes of blue, Jim Holton's after you. And one thing I've learned from the focus on of Jim Holton is that he's not six foot two and his eyes are brown. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of uh, poetic license going on there. <laughs> So the next one is just a little story about Michael Robinson. Um, it says, have you heard the one about the well-known First Division manager who tried to lure striker Michael Robinson away from Brighton with the promise that I'll make you an England international within six months? Now, should say they won't name the manager, but they hear Michael wasn't too impressed by his soccer knowledge, considering he'd been a Republic of Ireland international for two <laughs> years before. Burley Batch, Grimsby goalkeeper Nigel Batch, isn't as burly as he looks when he's on the pitch. Let Nigel tell you a secret. He says, I always wear three jerseys when I'm playing, whatever the weather. I hate to feel the cold when I'm playing. I feel it's essential for a keeper to be keyed up and on his toes. And you can't do that if you're not feeling right. Okay, so this is the first. Come on, David, what, what do we say about that? Ah, he's a big Jesse, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah th three, three tops is a bit extreme. It's, it's, it's not yeah. going to help your agility or things like that, is it? So no, that, Nigel, he played for Grimsby Town, 348 league games for his Grimsby Town before moving to Lincoln City. He had uh, 38 games between 86 and 90 at Darlington. Would you, is that a name you recall? Not at all, no. Yeah. Played for two clubs I've played for as well. No, yeah. I've never heard of it. Okay, yeah. so next one we're looking at is Quote of the Week. And it's from Terry Christie, manager of Meadowbank Thistle. And he says, running up and down sand dunes makes you good at running up and down sand dunes. It doesn't make you a footballer. I think that's a, a bit of a, a, a swipe, Tom. Yeah, I was Joe Wallace's famous yeah. training regime. Yeah, I, I know Hearts also did it as well. So, but I, I'm I'm sure it's probably a wee dig at Joe Wallace and doing that. We, we did that even when, in the nineties. I remember Mick Buxton was manager, or it might have been Terry Terry. But might have been Terry Butcher was manager. Mm. They, they they took us a couple of times to the sand dunes and feasted us on there. Even goalkeepers, I mean, that's just, there's no need oh, for that, is all, there? All of us, all of us. <laughs> I mean, it was embarrassing for me, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not made for running, that's why I was a goalkeeper. Yeah, listen, there's actually something coming up that says pretty much, I think it's Alan Ruff who says pretty much the same thing, but we'll get to that. So the next one we're going to look at is Sunderland's Sean Elliott. So it's mm. a new contract for Sean Elliott. He's 25-year-old defender Elliott has signed a new three-year contract with the club after being linked with several other teams in the recent months. He's hopeful of pushing on and staking a claim for an England cap. Another North East player bidding to catch the eye of Bobby Robson is Newcastle goalkeeper Kevin Carr, who's showing top form after missing the early weeks of season through injury. Now, Elliot would play for Sunderland until 1986, making 321 league appearances, uh, but he would never be capped at full level for England. No. Yeah, I remember Sean Elliott, centre-off. Yeah. What about the so, the goalkeeper, Kevin Carr? Yeah, Kevin Carr, lovely little bubble perm moustache, <laughs> which, which was, that was de rigueur for the time, wasn't it, you know? Yeah, yeah I'm thinking Terry McDermott and oh, the, the Kevin happened, Keegan and back then for Newcastle anyway. Uh, next one, Don's in demand. So Aberdeen have a couple of big glamour dates in England later this season. They're due to play Man United at Old Trafford in Martin Buchan's testimonial and also visit Ipswich Town for George Burley's benefit game. Man United will also host Celtic and Lou McCarry's testimonial. So I guess we can talk a little bit about Aberdeen here, yeah. David. What, what did you know about Aberdeen when you get the, the call they were interested in you, David? Yeah, I mean... Pff new fair bit about them actually I mean apart from apart from maybe the, the couple of years previous to to me going there you know I know that um, I mean looking back now you know I could see there's like maybe a little bit of a steady decline sort of towards the time I got there you know but um, oh, I was well up on what had happened in the 80s and the job that I saw Alex Ferguson doing and but when I got the when I got the, the call to go there it was the David Hodgson was the, the manager of Darwin which pulled us in the into the uh, in the dressing room at the training ground, say, look, Aberdeen are coming for you. What do you think? And I was like, oh, yeah, I want to go, like you know. Mm. And it, it, it was it was as simple as that. I've had lots of offers before and from championship clubs in in England that we decided it wasn't the best move for me. And then because I was especially because I was going straight in there and going to play, then it was it wasn't a yeah, there was no decision to make really. 
when you say straight in there to play, that's exactly what it was, wasn't it? What was it a day or two? Or yeah, two about, about three or four days. I think I went mm. up there on Wednesday night and then played on the Sunday against Celtic, and it was, yeah, I mean. Well, we don't need like, to talk about that. No, nah, we, we, we don't <laughs> at all, mate. But it, yeah, I mean, it was, um, for me, just going there, it was in my, my first impressions or my first thoughts before I went there was just that, yeah, it, you know, because of the championship was a one under at Strikes first in the history of the in European football, yeah, it was a big club for me to go to. Mm. What about the how quickly did you adapt it in terms of the the you know living there and just fitting in with everybody? About two years. <laughs> two years. <laughs> is it? it was about two years. Yeah. So, I mean, there was just because I don't actually think I played that badly. I played, I played her, even though I, th- I think I got like. It, it, we put, when we got beat 7 0 at, uh, at Celtic Park, I think I got a 10 in the newspapers the next year because I, so I made that many saves. But when I look back, the goals are horrendous, some are horrendous goals to give away. Yeah. But, but apart from that game, I don't think I played that badly in the other games. But the, we, we, as a team, we weren't playing very well at all. But it was, and then obviously I came out because I was injured and then I spent 15 months trying to get back in the side. And it just made things more difficult. Lo- loads of injuries, little injuries even there. And and then if you're playing well it, it, as a football, if, you, if you're playing well on the pitch and things going well on the pitch, everything else is all right. Yeah. And just just make things a little bit harder when, you know, you're walking down the street and, or you, you're having a drink somewhere and you, someone's calling you all the names under the sun. Or I, I remember after the, the Hearts game, it was one of the first games, one of the Hearts game, uh, I think it was, might be the third game or second or third game. And we got back from Hoss, we got beat 2-0, I think. And then I got back my car, Patoji, and I was going down Union Street. And I'm sat at a, at a traffic light. And I just see this fella running down the street. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Like, you know? And I'm thinking, there's nothing to do with me. I thought he was being chased or something, like, you know? So just as the lights turned on there, sort of yellow and green, and I'm just starting to pull away. He's right close. He just took a swoop and just booted the back of my car, like, you know? And I think, what's going on here? So I, as, I've, as I've pulled the window down to see what he, he was what his problem was like you know and he's just telling me i'm shite and you know go back down to england and all that like you know it's madness like you know mm. and that was happening on a regular things that happen, happen on a regular basis okay. I, i'm going out i'm going out to hand um hand vouchers out to the cheerleaders at christmas giving like a little christmas bonus for like i don't know what it was vouchers for top top shop or something like that and i got announced on the pitch and all crap well it felt like the whole crowd was booing me you know? <laughs> I, I, I like I liked how your um, it was a manual wind down that you you motioned there with the, the window. Because <laughs> <It was laughs> I think when I went up there, I had a, a, what the lads used to call it was a hairdresser's car. It was like a little Suzuki Vitara mm. Jeep. I like the idea of the the guy who kicked the car as you slowly wind down his weight and you're getting a bit, <laughs> you know. Come on, hurry up, hurry up! I want to abuse you. I want to abuse you. <laughs> yeah. It's it's funny oh, that it's funny that those fans how they they feel as if they're entitled. To do things like that, isn't it? I mean, obviously not all fans, but you know they do. They think they they can, you know, because they they see them on the TV or they see them in the pitch. They, they sort of think that they're within reach to be able to abuse them and and go up to them and tell them exactly what they think of them. And it's like, well, well, well do you know what? I mean, because it was um, because Aberdeen the way it is, and it's sort of like everything's just the whole city is just for the for the the, the one team. Yeah, and it's. For quite a big place, it's a village, really. Everyone knows each other, like, you know, and you can't get away from anybody. Like, you know, if you go into town and, you know, you're seen by lots of people and everyone knows who you are. And, like, it, 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 most of the time it's quite nice. People come up there, you know, come up to chat with you and, and all sorts. But the later it gets in the night, the more chance there is you're going to get, they're going to yeah, tell you yeah. a few home truths, like, you know. And to be fair, I, I always quite enjoyed it because, I remember being in, in a place one night and, and just hearing a commotion from the side of the room and some guy who's beaten he must look like a big old wench, got a kilt on and everything. And he's just shouting abuse at me and Robbie Winters, like, you know. And I'm thinking, well, if you're going to shout, if you're going to do it properly, at least come close to us to give us abuse, like, you know. So I just went up. So I used, I used to just go over to them, like, you know, and then have a bit of a, I don't know what it's like, try, just try and pile them up, like, you know yeah. what I mean? So, so they end up calling your yeah. names up the sun, then at the end of it, they'll, they'll buy you a drink. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. That's the real trick. That's the real trick. Turn it around <laughs> and get so that you get them to buy you a drink. Yeah. I mean, knowing that you've done that, got a drink out of somebody who's abusing you, that's that's the real win. Absolutely. 
And what, what did what did uh, working with Jim Leighton do for your career? Well, I mean, on a totally different level, Jim had already been through what I was going through at Aberdeen. Those two years that was Aberdeen were massive tests for me, sort of mentally. But, I mean, from what Jim went through, it was kind of like he was a massive inspiration to sort of to get back and to prove people wrong to exactly what he did. He did yeah. obviously. I mean, you know, it seems like it was a long time from that FA FA Cup final he dropped for Les Sealy to finally sort of full redemption in 1998 when he's he's playing the World Cup. Yeah, and. You know, it's not like he, he just spelt it in, spent that whole time in the wilderness. You know, he did well at Hibs and Dundee and, and places like that. But um, yeah, he, he was he was brilliant for me. And more than what he did on the pitch, which he did a lot for me. You know, there was a you know he was a really good coach. But all the chats that we had afterwards, and there'd be times when um, if things weren't going well. He just he'd, he'd say to the manager, whoever the manager was, he'd say, "I'm going to take lads down the beach. We're just going to do a bit on the on the sand down the beach, like you know." So we drive down the beach, and then there's a couple of cafes down on the on the beach in Aberdeen. One of them's called even the Snacky. So he says, "Come, we'll go to the Snacky." And we, there'd probably be four of us, four, uh, three three keepers and him, and we'd all order a full uh, full Scottish breakfast. Yeah, uh, Jim would always have a coke float. You know, like a oh, yeah. glass of cup, cup ice cream in. He'd always have one of them, like you know. And then we'd sit and chat about things. And so, rather than being a in like a, an environment where you think it's it's more formal, like in in the office with him or whatever. And it, it was just a really good way of sort of getting to relax and just putting things in a bit of perspective, like you know. And he was really good at that. Really good. So I, I mean, I I don't know. I don't know what people's perspectives are of Jim. You know, I know I know he's. You know the way that he's been portrayed in the in the press and that, and he, he's always kept a bit of a distance with the press because of what happened at Man United, and he's sort of been burnt a bit. And there's been a few stories in the in the press. I think when he was, um, I'm trying to think, he was living somewhere somewhere near Perth. It might have been when he was with Hibs, and there were some stories about the place that he was renting. That it was in this, it, there was a story about that, uh, that the, the landlord had complained that he'd wrecked the place. It was all bullshit, like you know what I mean. And so he was he was pretty guarded in that respect. Well, I think the, the the perception of him to what he really was like is totally different. Like you know, just a lovely fellow. Yeah, well, for me, he's a class act. Right? Like, just like you said, longevity he had, and, and like you say, that would have finished a lot of other keepers basically yeah. carrying the can for that game in the cup thing. Yeah, exactly. And do you know what? It was. I mean, I was the, the way that it finished for him. I was absolutely devastated for him. Like you know, to go out like that, like you know, breaking your jaw. Mm. I was at three places. Like you know, but um. I mean, I was just astounded even at the age he was. I think he was 39 when I first joined, almost 40. He, um, he, was, he was just a phenomenal keeper. You know, he, I, I was, first I was struck by a, a lot of his techniques where the way he caught the ball, he always like, he almost jumped in the air and caught it. And and a lot of the stuff that you did was, you would never coach somebody to do it, but it always worked for him. And I remember that season we, when we got the two cup finals, he got us all the way. I think I played the first couple of games in both cups. And then he 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 went on and, and played the rest of them, and but he got us to the finals. Like you know, he was absolutely phenomenal. And I think that um, you know he doesn't get the respect or the, or the credit that he deserves for for what he's done. Totally agree. I I I defend him to the hilt. I just I get angry when you know people are lazy in their their opinions of him. It's based on mm. you know just a small period of time in his career and. And that's what what they remember him for, and they don't even try and figure out what he did before, what he did after. No, I just I, I remember being being at well, was it Dundee? So it was at a Celtic game, Celtic Park, Celtic versus Dundee. And one of the saves he made, it was like point blank, and it was just one of the most incredible saves I've ever seen live. And it was like that's that's a goalkeeper that I know he was, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, and you know what? I mean, it, 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 I don't. Know. Of whether you forgive us for saying this, like, but he didn't. He, he didn't look like an athlete. Yeah. You know what I mean? He didn't look like an elite athlete. But you could. He could have played in any league. And then he. I don't know yet. Yeah, actually, I think, I'm sure he told me once that he, he had a chance to go to Germany before he went to Man United. I can't remember which. It might have been Werder Bremen or Hamburg, something like that. Anyway, he had a chance to go. He, he almost went to Germany, and he could. He, he could have done brilliantly anywhere. Like you know. Mm. Yeah, I think he was quite unfortunate at the time that. If Man United come for you, and obviously it was Sir Alex as well, like you know, you, you're not going to turn them down. But the time that he went, it was a real, it was a massive transition period for the club, and 
it, maybe he's not the the best time to be joining them, you know. But I'll th- tell you one of my favourite memories of Jim. It was one of the, the first one of the first times we uh, we travelled in a away game, and and I was not ready for this, not ready for this at all. And I think it must have been when I come back from injury because he wasn't on the bench. He was injured when I first went there. So like he got in the team after I got injured and I got back in the squad again. And then um, obviously the, the goalkeepers, we always used to swim together. Most of the time, teams don't like to do that because if, if one's got gets ill, they don't want the other one to get ill as well. But we always room together. And I just remember we, we'd been down for dinner and got back to the room and there was a knock on the door and the fella brought in a little, uh, little glass of sherry and uh, and he just put it on the side and Jim says, oh, that's for me. Like, you know, I'm going to have that. So he always had this little glass of sherry before, the night before a game. And, uh, and and for somebody who wasn't a drinker, you know, it was just like, I, I think he just got a, a routine of it. Mm. And uh, But as soon as we walked in the room, tracksuit came off, underpants came off, and he's just lying there on the bed naked, <laughs> drinking, <laughs> sipping, sipping, sipping his little glass of sherry. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I didn't know what that looked like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And... and like I said, Jim didn't look like an athlete. It wasn't a pretty sight, I'm telling you. Yeah. No, he, he did always have that. I always remember, because whenever he took a, a, a goal kick, he would always sort of end up on the floor. It looked like I, an effort for him, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which you'd never really seen other keepers do. But, okay. you, but you know what? It's talking about Jim as well. Andy Gorn was another one. Mm. Uh, it, it, down here, he doesn't get enough credit for, for what a phenomenal keeper he was. And I know maybe it's because both of them, both of them didn't have a long time down here in England, like you know. No, I know Andy started down here, like you know, but it all them. But um, he's another one, just absolutely brilliant goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, and a class act as well, like you know, mm. a real class act. Yeah. When when I first came up, I think he was at Motherwell at the time. Like, uh, we played them at home, and he come he come after the come to straight after the game, uh, to to say that he like, oh, I'll, I'll see you in the bar. Make sure you go in the, in the players' lounge afterwards, like you know. And that, me mum and dad were up that weekend, and he sat there for. I mean, he must have been driving back down himself, like you know. Just sat there for an hour and a half, t- talking me, me mum and dad, like you know, and just sort of asking how things were, and you know, if I needed anything, we just. I was a real class act. Mm, brilliant. I, I certainly know Oldham fans definitely remember him fondly. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you talk about British keepers in the eighties, in in sort of early nineties, you, you probably you probably wouldn't get mentioned, like you know, down yeah. here. By, by a lot of people. Yeah, that's a good good shout. Okay, we're, we're getting to the bit where I know Tom is quite happy this next bit is coming up, so we're going to have a look at some adverts, which are for <laughs> watches. Uh, so there's three adverts on this page for watches, and each has a photo of the watch in question. Different watches, but they're all part of the one advert, because it, it actually does look as if they're sort of different adverts, because they're sort of different styles in the way that the adverts are done, but it's all the one company. So the first one we'll look at is this West Ham United watch. And it says price slashed to £7.95. Which one's the West Ham United one? Yeah, the one on the left. So price slashed... Oh, West Ham United on it. Yeah, no, uh, actually. <laughs> I lost it for a second there. That's getting cut out. Don't you worry. You're not getting that in there. <laughs> uh, so they, they say that you get a free pen, a free pen watch with every soccer watch, which they say is worth £6.50. Um, so yep as, as David has rightly said there it, what makes it a West Ham United watch it says West Ham United on the front and it has a, a little football underneath it as well uh, it says it's available for four divisions pre- presumably in England it says Glasgow which I think from our experience that usually denotes Rangers it says Celtic and Aberdeen so there we go but now also uh, England and Scotland watches available uh, the next one is the fastest selling Melody watch on the market. It's a big market, is the, the Melody watch market. So, But this is the fastest selling one. It's Again, at £7.95. It does look a bit fancier on the front. So we've got dual time, nightlight, Melody alarm, automatic calendar, chronograph with lap time, and six time functions with day flag. I'll have two. That's I'll take two. I, 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 this idea of a, a calendar on a watch like that, I, I've no idea how that would work. No idea the, the the amount of details or what you could put on the calendar, other than it just showing you maybe what the days and dates are. So I don't know. So the next one is a multi melody watch. You get nine 
nine, yeah, I said nine different melodies with hourly chime. Fantastic value at £9.95. It plays a different tune every day of the week, plus birthday and Christmas alarm. I actually like that idea. That on your birthday, it might play happy birthday when you wake up at Christmas. I don't know what a Christmas tune would be. Well, what would the Christmas tune be? I don't think a good good King Winsless. <laughs> okay, no, that's that, what it would that'd be. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, Tom, go on. I know you like these. No, yeah, no, it's, it's just, just the kind of thing that that's what you would cover at that age, you know what I mean? These these digi, these digi watches, you know? <laughs> and uh, that was the, the, the cutting edge technology at the time. Digital watches and all the mad things that they could, they could do. I also remember the having the, the little light up bit, so you press one in and it would light up, and I also remember looking at those in the dark. I, I know you, you, you'd previously, I think it was uh, on Graham Hunter's podcast, David, where you spoke about you had this um, the England lamp or something like that that you used to read by and that that sort of reminded me of having a watch that you go under the covers and you and you do that torch thing and it would, it would be a poor poor bit of light you would get but it was everything at that age absolutely everything yeah. so let's have a look at so the next one next page is my soccer world by phil thompson so phil says when bobby robson included six black players amongst his 22 man squad for the game against west germany I was one of the first to put my hands together and applaud the bold new approach. It was a clear sign that the England boss is determined to do things his way, to break away from the tradition and to experiment. Black players are making a bigger and bigger impact on our game, and the best of them deserve to be given their chance at the top level. They'll bring a new look to England, give us a touch of the Brazilian flair. If we can add a South American flavour to traditional English football, then we can beat the world again. Black players love showing off their spectacular ball skills, especially wingers like John Barnes of Watford and Stokes Mark Chamberlain. I really enjoyed the company of the coloured lads with England. Their terrific sense of fun and enthusiasm in training made sure we never had a dull moment. So Phil then goes through describing the attributes of the rest of the team, the rest of those players, um, and he's been impressed by them all. He finishes by saying, Now that blacks are making the breakthrough into the international ranks, I hope the racist fans will accept them and give them cheers instead of jeers. Where do you, I mean, I know he's trying to be what he's trying to be like, but it's not coming across. I mean, this idea that we placate the racist fans and say, No, no, just accept them rather than saying, Oh, excuse me, get to fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Different world, isn't it? Yeah. So, a spoiler, the West Germany versus England match took place on the 13th of October and West Germany won 2-1 and Hill and Regis started with Blissett coming off the bench for that game. Okay, page 8, yep, we're going to be more watches. So, I'm going to try to think, what, what date is this? This is um, 30th of October, so it's not that close to Christmas, so I think we're being spoiled a, a little bit here. So, first up is a radio on your wrist. Uh, it's a micro radio with a big, big sound. Space Age technology. £12.99, complete with headphones. A watch with headphones that you put. You, you imagine what the headphones were like back then. <laughs> two pieces of string and two cups. Two <laughs> cups yeah. So the next up is a calculator watch. Now, this, this was the bee's knees, this. £9.95. And then we have a 10 4 walkie talkie CB receiver. And it says these units are not licensable in the UK. Cost fourteen ninety five, and it's in really small, small print there. Comments on any of this stuff? Well, I think it's really interesting that you've had five adverts there for watches, or for five different watches, and then there's also an advert for Aladdin's Cave where you can can you sell the sell the watches there? Yeah, you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, Hi. So it's said it, it's already saying, well, these are crap. You won't like them, but you can sell them here. It's probably the same people. Mm. Yeah. So by the time they've bought them back, they've, they've made a six quid profit anyway. Yeah, so keep keep this advert handy, this little bit handy when you're, <laughs> when you're buying those. No, but that, that was a good spot. That or send send four pound ninety nine and any old watch, and we'll send you a brand new snooze alarm watch, guaranteed for twelve months. There we go. CBs, anybody? Tom, you have a CB radio? Ten no, four for a that, copy. I remember when when they were all the. You remember when they were all the craze? There was CBs and they used to interfere with the TV, mm-hmm. and then um, it always used to we'll be watching Crossroads or something. Then it'd be ten four for a copy, ten four for a copy. We missed days like that. My nan and granddad used to be mad into it, 
mad into it. Yeah. Granddad, he was he was the like the um, the concert chairman at the club, so he was a people. He he always booked all like the acts, like you know, and he knew all the big, you know, the big sort of uh, club comedians and that, like you know. Mm. But he, he was he was mad into his, uh, his CB, and I just I don't know why I remember this, but my nana's um, sort of what what's a, what's the name called? It's not code name or something like, but it was like a. Uh, yeah, you you won't have your your own little name. Yeah, she was saying handle. She, handle, yeah. Yeah, handle, yeah. Her handle was nutmeg. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I've I've never thought about that for about thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's such a that's such a, a I don't know what age she was at the time, but it's it's like such an old womany type thing, you know. It's probably in her fifties at the time, I think. Yeah, yeah she'll be in her fifties. So. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. it's the equivalent of me, what's your handle? Oh, it's lavender. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so moving on to just going to have a quick look. There's a half page photo of Gary Williams of Aston Villa, and the first thing I notice is that pitch looks absolutely immaculate. So I'm guessing that is mm. right at the beginning of the season. Um, it's you, a great shot, that, eh? Yeah. So That's it's a Lecoq, Lecoq Sportif. And what I have noticed is. The badges, there, there was quite a few, and maybe maybe they were just Lecoq Sportif ones, but the badges were central at this, this point on a lot of strips, and that seemed to be a, a bit of a style at the time. But, yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive that underneath the badge it says Champions of Europe. Yeah. You know, you, you don't get that very often, so that's a that's a great photograph. Uh, next one is Didi. So we're on pages 12 and 13. Didi at Old Trafford. It says, Will United or City reign in Manchester? This is the age-old question. And it's a two-page spread of colour photos of Man United on the left page and Man City on the right. The Man U photos are taken from the game against West Brom, where it shows Frank Stapledon, Mike Duxbury, Norman Whiteside, Arnold Murant and Ray Wilkins. And on the City side, we have Aga Haraida, David Cross, Tommy Caton, Paul Power and Kevin Reeves as they take on Norwich City. Um, now, the game that they're talking about here ended in a 2-2 draw with uh, City taking the lead by Dennis Stewart. They went 2-0 up with David Cross, but a Frank Stapledon double gave them uh, a 2-2 draw. Uh, again, the kits are just brilliant. Um, we've got the, the Man United one, which is uh, Adidas. Or I'd say I, I, I did a combination of what I normally do and what I normally don't want to do. Adidas. It's, it's an Adidas, it's not Adidas, it's Adidas. The the West Brom one is Umbro, but it doesn't have the the diamonds. So I guess it, it's a slightly earlier one. Um, the Man City, for me that's a classic Man City strip. The light blue, shiny, the white piping, sort of from the shoulder bit goes down. And that Norwich City kit. So what, what would be your favourite, we talked about your favourite um, kit earlier on. Is that your favourite kit of all time or is that your favourite England kit? What would be your favourite kit of all time, David? No, I think that was my favourite kit. But I, I remember it about 1985, Sunderland um, had Nike, which was pretty. Uh, I don't think many teams will, will have had them around that time. I mean, everyone's got them now, like you knowing the, the Premier League. But yeah, it was just like a white sh- white shoulders uh, and just the the stripes on the on the chest and, and stomach, you know. And it was uh, it was probably because it was around the, the time that I started watching Sunderland. Yeah. But even even looking back now, you look through all the kits, the Sunderland kits that they've had, it's probably my favourite, I think. But it, just just looking at the, these pictures, he mentioned that it was uh, Olga Horaida, the centre off there. Yeah, he's an absolute leg, Norwegian legend. Him, he's married. I think he's married managed Norway quite a bit. I think he's manager of uh, Rosenborg at the minute. Right. Yeah, he's an absolute legend over in there in Norway. So the next thing we're going to look at here is Tartan talk with Alan Ruff. A heading says, I still want to play for Scotland. So it's a long way from Malaga to Methyl. And frankly, in a football sense, it's one better forgotten. That's what Ruff says. He continues by saying, I'll never forget the summer of 82 when I played for my country in the World Cup in Spain. In packed stadiums and with the television eye of the world upon us. Just just weeks later, I was playing against such teams as East Fife in front of crowds hardly larger than some of the, the Brazilian samba bands who serenaded the Brazil-Scotland match in Seville. Not to put too fine a point of it, things have been kind of hard to swallow, but there is little I can do about it. I'm desperate to get back into the Premier Division. I'm aware relegation with Thistle hardly did anything for my international prospects. Now, he doesn't expect to be in the Scotland squads, but 
now that he's playing in a lower division, uh, but he's still hopeful. Uh, he's hopeful of getting a move back to the Premier and talks about a move to Hibs that fell through when boss Betty Ob was sacked. And he reminisces of his childhood and how events in his footballing life, but he could never have dreamt of how it's went since then. He says, I would never have thought that all that could lie in front of me when I played at primary school and was always the last boy left when the sides were picked. In Glasgow, that meant only one thing. You were in goal. So I grew up to be a goalkeeper. I'm not, we're not accepting that, are we? That That's how goalkeepers are born? No, and then I, I don't believe him for one minute. That's, <laughs> that's the only reason why I became a goalkeeper. Yeah. I, I, I've never seen much of Ruffy playing, to be honest with you. But you know, no, Jim... Uh, Jim Leighton always said to me that he was the most naturally gifted goalkeeper he'd he'd, he'd worked with. Hmm. He said he was he was brilliant as well, like, you know. I, th- I think I think um, you had to be because I, I don't think he the, the coaching was there for him. I don't that level of coaching. I'm sure there was coaching, but no. But you, you know what? It's funny. I did I did a, a show with uh, Alex Stepney uh, a few weeks ago. It was really interesting talking to him. That he, you know he was talking about that. You know, obviously now you've got all the analysts who do the work for you, and the coach does a lot of um, sort of research for you when you, you know, you, for different opponents, for you know, when you come up against certain teams, what to expect and things like that. And he said he like he used to go and sort of watch other, well, he used to go and watch other teams to see how they played and what to expect. So he'd do a little bit of homework on them, but also he used to go to games to watch goalkeeper other goalkeepers yeah. and see what they did, and that's how he learned. He just learned by doing it himself, but also by watching other goalkeepers as much as he could, like you know. And it was, yeah, different times. Yeah. So, so the end of the article, it was quite interesting. What he says here. So he speaks of what people reckon was a battle between him and Bob Wilson, the BBC TV presenter. And Ruffy says, but what people didn't know is that Bob wrote me a three-page letter explaining what he was trying to say on television about me and how it had been taken the wrong way by newspapers. And I accepted that, but I felt differently about the criticism by such as Alf Ramsey, who never saw me play week in, week out for Thistle. So I, I like that stuff because I, I like I like Bob Wilson a lot, and I think it just shows the sort of you know to to go to that sort of length to to explain to Ruffy um, what he was trying to do. I think that's the mark of the man there, and it's also you, you can't imagine him saying anything bad, can you? No, no, absolutely not. No, exactly. And um, saying that I, I get what he's saying there about Alf Ramsey as well about the fact that you know it's like this is what I'm talking about with, with Jim Layton. It's like people would criticise without actually seeing the full picture, the full man, the full player, and it's based yeah. on just one-off events. But I, I think that's why um, you see um, the, the player ratings in newspapers the day after a game. Mm. I think that's that's why footballers, especially back then, and sort of certainly when I first started, was pe- uh, players were so obsessed with them. Because that was, you know, every, that's what everyone read. You know, nobody nobody saw the footage of the game. Nobody saw yeah. how how well you actually played, or you know what you could, you know, whether you could do better with goals or whatever like that. All the souls are marks in the papers. So that, that's changed a hell of a lot now as well, because people have obviously they see every minute of every match, mm. and they can they're obviously a bit more. Well, I think people are a bit more knowledgeable now about football, so they make their own minds up. But yeah, it does. It did make a big difference back then. Mm. I'm going to, um, there's a Nobby cartoon at the bottom there, which I'm, as Tom knows, I'm just going to go right over. Um, or should we have a look? You want to have a look at it, David? No, no, I was just, I just having to see what it was. Are, are these not normally very funny, are they not? Yeah, I, I have a, to, Tom comes from a different slant on it. I, I don't think they're funny, um, but Tom is so, sort of more about, you know, the, the the artistic side of it rather than anything well, else. Well, I, I, I just kind of go, look, like these guys have done these kind of cartoons were kind of knocking out, you know, something for shoot, something for motor weekly, you know, something for fishermen's weekly or whatever. And I think they were battering out stuff like that all the time. And, and I don't think it really shows. See, when you sort of look at their work, you, know, you, you see the artist actually is a really good technical artist. But, you know, this is this is the brief to, to do a sort of recess scribble drawing like this and knock it out of the football a joke most of the jokes aren't that funny but, there we uh, go yeah. with this, my that, point. One, that one's up that one's up bad though is it it's a little it, it doesn't make you laugh but makes you smile it? <laughs> it makes you smile with the background of what we are saying that's what it is if you just read that <laughs> then you'd be like right, okay move on speaking of which so there's roughly there so I'm going to move on a couple we're going to go to we'll come back to a few of them but right now we're going to go to focus on David Priest. So you'll be more than aware, David, of the focus on sections in the magazines where the 
the footballers of the day were asked the standard question, so we're going to send them your way. So here we go. Full name. David Douglas Priest. Birthplace. Sunderland. What was your first car? It was uh, A Reg 1983 Nissan Micra. It was gold with a tan velour interior. Cost £300. Manual windows as well. It was almost a manual car, to be fair. <laughs> the, amount of times it, the amount of times it broke down. Was like... <laughs> Who's your favourite player of all time? Oh, great question. Um, I'd have to say, I, I always go back to Bruce Grobler. He was like my first real sort of hero when I was a kid. Mm. Loved him. Great. Okay, who's your favourite team? You can only have one with us. Sunderland. One. Yep. Yeah, Sunderland. Most memorable match? Oh, as a fan or as a player? You you can choose. Uh, do you know what? I I can't remember half the games that I played in my career. I don't. I just. I don't. Know, that's the concussions kicking in or what? I know, but <laughs> but when I was up in Scotland, beating Celtic at Celtic Park for the first time, that was that was massive. Yeah. Considering the, the history of the sort of. By the time I was there, that we, we normally used to get battered when we weren't there. So, mm-hmm. okay, that's a good one. Uh, what's been the biggest thrill in your life? I, I mean, I have to say, me, me daughter being born. But apart from me daughter being born, I think it would probably have to be the day that I signed for Sunderland. Um, it was at a, uh, it was at a in a time where Derby Sunderland against Newcastle Road Park, and I actually signed signed my forms. On the pitch, on wow. a little table, you know, like yeah. while the, while the t- both teams were warming up, yeah, beautiful stuff. Like. That, that 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 style of signing used to be quite popular. It's not done nowadays. No, it's never done, is it? Mm. No, I think the only people who do it is Real Madrid and in Barcelona when they get them to do keep you up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, ne- next one. The biggest disappointment. Oh, I'd have to say leaving Sunderland in uh, in nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, yeah, it was devastating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the best country you've visited? Oh, that's a great question. I'd have to say Italy's a big favourite of mine. Love, absolutely love Italy. So I'd say Italy. Okay. Um, what's your favourite food? Definitely, definitely Chinese. I've got a, I've got a Chinese open just opposite, literally opposite me here. Yeah. And it's just been done out and, and it's reopened, it's been rebranded and it's beautiful. I saw. Do you get the delivery or do you go for it? Ah, I mean... I I do have to I do have to put my slippers on to go across the tip <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Okay, miscellaneous lights. So give me two things you like doing. Oh, I should get a bit of a warning for this. Oh, I don't know. I might I might have to go back to this one. What do I like doing? Uh, well, it seems we talk about food. I, I am an incredibly big eater, but I I eat a hell of a lot of crap, like mm-hmm. mainly crisps and biscuits. Right. It's a massive weakness. I'm, I'm I'm finding out now that the age I am that I can't eat them as much as I used to. Mm-hmm. When I was playing, I used to eat anything. Oh, I used to eat all sorts. It didn't it didn't touch me. I couldn't put. I, I tried for twenty years to put weight on, and I couldn't do it. No matter what, I, how much I ate, how much I was in the gym, couldn't. Yeah, as soon as I stopped, I get the little bum bag around here now. <laughs> okay, we'll just go with the one then. Um, so yeah. this one may be easier. Miscellaneous dislikes. So give us a couple of things that drive you up the wall. Oh. I am very impatient. Do you know what? I, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time in airports in the last few years, especially in Sweden, because we were always, uh, we fly to every away game when we're in Sweden. And obviously I've been, God knows how many times I've come back and forth. And it's been a lot harder the last year, sort of with the restrictions, where when I've come back, I've had to come back through Poland and via Helsinki and all sorts. But in airports, do you know when you're waiting to check in, Especially when you go on holiday. If you go on holiday, it's usually a big line. Uh, it, one thing that bugs me the most is people standing too close to you. The person behind stand too close to you. So you know, like you, you shuffle up a, uh, up a little bit when when it, you know one person goes down, but they're almost on your back, like breathing down the back of your neck. Yeah. And 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 a few times, you know, I, I, I'm not saying I get physical with them, but I'll you know, I'll just let the line in front of me go about three or four metres so there's a massive gap and I'll just stand where I am and I can I can see that they're, they're fuming <laughs> behind me because yeah. I'm not moving down yeah so that, that's that's a massive dislike I hate that um, what else oh, I don't know yeah you, you, you should have given me a bit but I should have had a bit All right, listen, well, well, that's, that's a good one we'll, we'll go with one each for that favourite TV show 
of all time? Oh, the Sopranos. Although I, I, I've only just read, uh, just watched uh, The Wire, mm-hmm. and uh, that, that's phenomenal as well. Like I really love that. But Sopranos, I can just I think I've watched it about four times now, all the way through. So if I've got nothing to watch, I can just stick one of those on. It's, I just love watching it. Mm-hmm. And see something different every time I watch it as well. Love yeah, it. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, what's your favourite singers or band? My favourite band is In Excess. A, a, a real deep affection for Michael Hutchins. Absolutely loved him. And um, and no matter what I'm listening to, it's all sorts, but I'll, I'll always go back and listen to them. Listen to In Excess. Absolutely love them. Okay. Favourite actors? Favourite actor? Hmm. It's a good question, Matt. I've been watching a lot of. I tell you what, I've been watching a lot lately. I've been watching a lot of um, like David Letterman interviews on YouTube. You know, I watched quite a few uh, Joe Pesci ones. I, I re- he's an interesting character. I like watching all the like the real famous. Not what you get now, you know. You see, you see everybody, you know, everybody inside out now. But all like the old actors, especially even before that, like from the seventies and eighties. Even watching likes of um, you know, the old roasts with um. Um, Martin. Dean Martin used to, yeah, yeah exactly. Just watching them, watching them, and the like. Is it Don Rickles and people like that? Just love all them. But I'll go with Joe Pesci. Okay. Um, who's your best friend? Again, I mean, I probably should say me missus. I, I probably should say that, yeah. So if we can just, yeah, I'll, I'll put this in just so in case you listen to the back. But <laughs> I'll probably say. Uh, I've got, I've got a couple. Um, I've got a few mates back home. We went to school. Yeah, been going to school since we were about eight, nine of us. Mm-hmm. Since we were about, um, yeah, since well, four, five of us since we were five, and we're still seeing mates now, like you know. Mm-hmm. So I'd say I'd I'd say them, but in football, probably is, uh, Luke Steele. Right. Okay. Who's been the biggest influence on you? Um. <sighs> I mean, my dad was my first real hero because that's how I got into football. I, I wanted to be a goalkeeper because he was a goalkeeper and I got, I'd go and watch him. But I think the first huge influence on me was uh, was Jimmy Montgomery, right. uh, the goalkeeper from the 73 Cup final. Um, he, was, uh, he, he was so influential because he, what, he was really my first goalkeeping coach when I was sort of 16 when I first joined, but he was also my youth team coach as well. Right. It was him and a guy called George Hurd, uh, who was a Scottish international mm-hmm. in the fifties. Um, yeah, they were like sort of uh, both the youth team coaches. So, so probably yeah, I'd say the both of them, but more Jimmy Montgomery because of he, he was my goalkeeper coach. Great stuff. Last question: Which person in the world would you most like to meet? Oh, that's a that's a very good question. Probably the person who hands out the big checks for the lottery wins. Mm. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to use ones that have been used in. Focus, um, focus on articles. Is that you, that's oh, every you, time, every it? time. Yeah. Oh, are you joking? Oh, yeah. He's oh. me thinking I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> all, all different and yeah. unique. Um, oh. No, listen, we'll go with that, but I will find somebody who said it, and I will, I will. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I did think it just like one of the real tyrants in the world, and just give him a real fucking good shape. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what you just did there with the about the the check thing? That's when on Twitter when you think of something, you think that's really funny. I'm going to put and just before you saying <laughs> you say, wait, now has anybody else sent that? You know, you, you must have done that where you, you find so, it. So, like, yeah. So you go and search it. Yeah. And it's like page after page after page, and you're like, delete, delete draft. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. The thing is, when they were doing when they were doing this, it was probably like the hands out the checks to win the pool. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the focus on Tom. Do you have any questions there? I well, dude, I, I was going to ask you. I know you've uh, spoken about a concussion in football. Are, are you still sort of surprised that concussion is not really, still not really taken as seriously in the game? Yeah, I mean, they've been going on it for a long. Well, ever since I first started, you know, there's been the conversations about it, but there really is very little being done by the authorities, especially some, uh, the PFA as well. You know, because it's it's you know their uh, their members that that the, the affects. So you think if there's any sort of um, don't know if they, if you're going to have any sort of process like they're having in the NFL now, where people are claiming damages for for what's happened to them in the past, then yeah, then it's it's surprising that they ha- they haven't made any steps towards it either. You know, and I mean. 
of course, there has to be lots of research done, but it just seems that everything's been put into rather than sort of this research has done, this research has been done, when really we, we, we know enough now to know that, you know, that, yeah, I mean, the evidence is there. You know, you see all these players from the, uh, from the 60s and 70s now who are in, in, and even ones in the 80s who are starting to sort of have the onset of dementia and, and dying because of it. And it's, it, 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 you just need to pull the finger out over it, you know? I mean, I, mine's not really been head in the ball, but I mean, there's, you know, I've, I've had quite a few concussions after that first concussion at Celtic Park. I just I must have had it's created like a weakness, you know, a bit like a glass jaw. So when I was getting any, sometimes I was getting, you know, slight knocks and then I'd be, I'd be concussed, you know. But it it was um, and, but there's just especially as a goalkeeper. I mean, there's so many times when you get the ball smashed in your face, uh, or you you, you get knocks to the head and you just sort of shake it off and then you know you, you just get on with it. So it, it is something that needs to be looked at. But I mean, I, I'm not sure. There was I know there was a lot of talk about you know should we take heading out of the game or should we just take it out of training and it, it, there needs to be a lot more talk about it and I think well, we are getting to that point now you know but yeah we, we, we're behind the times with it yeah okay listen we'll, we'll jump back into the magazine I'm just going to jump back a few pages and we'll, we'll go through the, the Sunderland team group so the centre pages is is taken at Roca Roca Park in front of what looks like an Archibald Leach stand but did Sunderland have an Archibald Leach stand yeah, I think I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on that side, that was it. Yeah, because mm. the the other two Rangers and Everton are the two that spring to mind for myself. I don't know if there was was there any other ones that anybody can think of the, the same sort of design. Oh, yeah. no idea. So sorry, what, what do you make of that shirt, David? That's a sort of departure for the the fixed stripes. I like that one. Yeah. The... Well, I, I think you know what you're saying about the Aston Villa one. I think this is Lecoq Sporty yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's the same with the badge in the middle. Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't really like that one because it's not a traditional. Nice departure from the normal, th- you know, just normal stripes. The tracksuits, the tracksuits are nice. I think the the ones that the manager and the coaches are wearing, I quite like those. But yeah, I, I don't think. I mean, it's the white one. It's like double. It's tram lines, but it's it's not all the way down. Yeah, it's it's maybe not the the greatest of strips. Uh, the goalkeeper strip is. Two tone green and, and stripes again, probably a, a common sort of design of the, of the period. It looks as though the keepers there maybe just came into pre season. <laughs> uh, he, he was another one who went to Man United, Chris Turner. I think he was, a, he, yeah, he, he was, I think, probably more famous now for being John Sitton's other half on the uh, all in for a fiver documentary. Mm. So, do you want to talk through the the picture at all, David? What does this team mean to you? Recollections of the players and things like that. Yeah, I, I think I'd I'd been to watch them at this this time, but I hadn't. Um, I mean, Chris Turner was the big one for me because he was a he was a class goalkeeper. He was only about five foot ten, five foot eleven. Mm. wasn't the tallest, but really good, really talented. And because um, I went to watch a lot of the games in the. Um, a couple of years later, they, they, they got to the Mill Cup final, League Cup final against Norwich, and uh, Chris Turner was a goalkeeper then. And you've got um, top left, you've got Nick Pickering, who I think he actually played for England, yep. left back. He was once capped it, once, yeah. Yeah, next to the, I think it's Rob Hindmarch, centre half. Colin West, top right, he played for Rangers, mm. yeah, striker. Sean Elliott's the one uh, with the blonde there on the left. Yeah, John, the, the little guy next to him, John Cook. He actually came back to the club as kit man. Right. And he, he was kit man when I was at Sunderland and there was a big uproar this year because the club got rid of him. Yeah. The, uh, the last owners got got rid of him. I have no idea why because he'd been there for like 20, uh, yeah, about, it must be 25 years, yeah, around that time. Mm. Try to think. Gordon Chisholm in the middle. He's a big, big unit there, a, isn't he? Yeah. But, but, but did he manage Falkirk? Gordon Chisholm, born in Glasgow, managed Dundee. He actually managed Dundee United, um, Queen of the really? South, and Dundee. I don't remember him being manager of that. Um, he took Queen of the South to the Scottish Cup final in two thousand and eight, as well. That might be it. Yeah, yeah, that mm. might be it. And then you got Barry Venison next to him, the blonde bombshell. Yeah. Um, who's in the front? Ian Atkins on the right, um, uh, right front. He uh, he's my he was assistant manager at Terry Butcher. 
he was um, a good story about the, those two. The, the day before they got sacked, I think they got they knew they were getting sacked, and I think it was the maybe it was the Wednesday or Thursday before a game on the Saturday. Uh, so they sent us all on a six mile run, <laughs> and I mean nobody does that anyway during the season. But yeah, they sent us all on a six mile run, and um, which it was up fine by me because um, we uh, I was with Tony Norman and Alec Chamberlain, the two goalkeepers. Uh, and we just jumped on the bus because <laughs> <laughs> what, what they used to do is used to used to drive out to like South Shields or somewhere which about, is about six and a half miles away and then they drop us off there and then make us run back so they, they dropped us all there in the minibus and then we just waited around let others get off uh, let others get off and just get off we were back or something and then we just jumped on the bus we didn't have any money on us but the, the bus driver let us on and we just drove back on the, <laughs> on the bus to the ground brilliant <laughs> It wasn't my fault he was getting the sack anyway. I never played. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think else. Oh, is, is, uh, Stan Cummins, legend at the club for scoring a winner again. I think he might have scored a trick against um, against Newcastle in a, in a, in a derby game. And mm. uh, Ian Munro, he's Scottish, is he? He is, yeah. yeah. He played for yeah, yeah. St Mirren, Rangers. Who else? Did they play for anybody else or something? Hips. Hips, yeah. No, no, this is it. Um, Stan Cummins, the little fellow with Tash, he he did. Sc- I think he scored a winner against Liverpool at Anfield the season before, and then at the front left, that's Gary Rowell, and you know, it, like he's a legend because I think he he was the one who scored that trick against uh, against Newcastle. Mm. But you know, when everyone's you know, man, you when they sing um, with the, the Cantona song, the Twelve Days of Christmas, yeah. Uh, Sunderland fans sing uh, sing a song with Gary Rowell, so it's like uh, number one is Gary Rowell, number two is Gary Rowell, and then we all live in the Gary Rowell world. So that was it. Yeah, he's the leg- he's the he's a big legend at the club. So the, the, I mean, that's you picked up Barry Venison there with the the flock of seagulls almost starting there. There's a few. There's a lot of them um, highlights creeping into hairstyles and stuff there. Um, Alan McCoy's got a few. You know, hints of um, blonde in his hair there as well. Oh, he's quite. I think, do you know what? I didn't even recognise them. Right, I, th- I, th- I thought he's, he's deliberately he's jumped over Alan McCoy. The only one he'd ever mentioned was Alan McCoy. <laughs> no, 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 that's not that's not a range of thing. Yeah. I, just, I generally didn't recognise him. But the uh, the the manager Alan Durbin, the, the middle row left, yeah. he, he became back as, as he, I think he was chief scout uh, under Peter Reid. Mm. I got a bollock then off him one night when we. Um, we were supposed to. We went away to Ireland for a preseason trip, and anyway, long story short, we end up. I was only about nineteen, or something like that, and we were all in the Guinness. And end up, we end up in the in the sea. All all of us in there, just everyone end up in the sea. And we all come back, and it was about four in the morning, or something like that. And we thought, oh, well, they'll not still be up. And he was sat, just sat in the chair <laughs> outside the <laughs> lift, waiting for everyone coming in, just ticking them all off, like you know. So if you noticed in the bottom left of this, it, it's, the team photo has been adorned with a Panini sticker of Frank Worthington. So whoever owned this magazine at the time has, um, I think he joined you know, the spell between 82 and 83. Um, and it's from the 8081 Panini sticker album. So I think there's also something later on in the magazine. Yeah, so it's the guy who actually had the magazine that's done yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. That's great. I, I've, I've seen that a few times. Oh, there's one... There's one on the back. It is a sticker of, um, oh, what's his name? He was at Norwich City, but then went to Spurs, managed Spurs for a little bit. Who am I thinking of? Mike Walker. No, more recently, more recently. Oh, Tim Sherwood. Tim Sherwood. Right, so so on the back of the magazine, and it's like when I saw it, I just thought, oh my God, that melts my heart. Somebody who had that magazine put a sticker on it, and wrote beside it, write to me soon, Tim. And I just thought, oh, how how cute and, you know, at the same time, really, really sad is that. <laughs> yeah, I actually played with Frank Worthy in a, in a testimonial. Right. Mm. It, 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 it ended up being, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the kid at the time, like, you know, because he was a few years younger than me, but I played with a guy called Peter Gilbert, and there was actually his dad. Dad died of a heart attack, very young. Right. So there was a test, we had a testimonial for him, and it was like our foot, our first team against like sort of a yes, like celebrity eleven or whatever. And I, I played for the the celebrity eleven, and, uh, and Frank Worthington came and played. He, he must have been about fifty at the time. Hmm. Easy, easy fifty, best player on the pitch by a mile. 
Unbelievable. You say, you say that, that he must have been 50, but to be fair, he looks 50 in that 1980 photograph <laughs> as well. So. Yeah. There's a, a bit of Errol Flynn about him there, isn't there? Yeah. 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 So there's, there's a there's a bit in the magazine I'm, I'm going to go to it just now with Frank. So let's just skip on to that because it's it's magical. Me and my girl. <laughs> so this is page twenty seven, and it's speaking of Frank Worthington. So this page is three black and white photos of Frank with his fiancee model Carol Dwyer. Frank is wearing tight jeans with a top that is a, a <laughs> I'm going to describe this as a plunging neckline to reveal his hairy chest and golden chain. And one he's wearing a cowboy hat and is pictured along with Carol and a horse. The main photo has him with Carol, who is wearing a vest and some Daisy Duke-type shorts that really are quite well-fitting, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the last photo shows Carol sitting beside a topless Frank on his sofa. On the wall above and behind him is a photo of Frank. I just love this. What this reminds me of? It reminds me of Airplane. The scene where Lloyd Bridges has, has a photograph of himself in the background. It is it is wonderful. It's wonderful. I mean, it's it's just perfect. He's sitting there, top off, but he's got a photograph of himself in the background. That's just magic. It's everything that you hear about Frank Worthington just in a, a little page yeah. spread there. Brilliant. Yeah, so, yeah, th those shorts are quite revealing. So, so yeah. <laughs> so is James. <laughs> yeah. So moving on to lineups, results, scorers, um, pages twenty eight and twenty nine. Now, unfortunately, this section um, there was mentioned that a recent uh, record defeat that Sunderland had um, against Watford is in here, which was eight 0 defeat is mentioned in this one. So I apologise for that. That was a good Watford side, though, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, is that a, was that Chris Nickel or Jimmy Nickel playing for them? I think for Sunderland. I think that's Chris. That'll be Chris Nickel uh, back then. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy did play there, like you know. But... Mm. So the, 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 there's there was quite a few high score games that that day. So Stoke four, Luton four as well, and we have uh, Coventry four, Everton two. A hat trick by Jim Melrose, um, which um, Barca Jim, which I think you know Barca Jim, he absolutely hates. Yeah, yeah. He hates Jim Melrose with a passion. So he'll love to hear that he scored the hat trick for Coventry there. Um, I mean that Everton team. Again, looks absolutely fantastic. Um, so, absolutely great names in there. Um, next one, Liverpool 5, Southampton 0. That seems like a regular result. Southampton <laughs> seem to get... They do seem to get a few drubbings over the years, don't they? Next one, Spurs 4, Nottingham Forest uh, 1. At least, do you know what? They, they've saved themselves here because they put not M Forest. And the worst thing, as we know, they can put is Notts Forest. That, that, that's, that's a no-no. To say Notts is Notts County and Nottingham Forest. Um, we've got West Ham four, Man City one. So as I say, quite a few high-scoring uh, games that day. We'll look at the Scottish Premier. I'm afraid your boys took a wee bit of beating there, David. Uh, Aberdeen one, Rangers two. Strachan penalty, Johnston and Pritz for Rangers. Twenty-two thousand at the game. Good crowd there for uh, Aberdeen. Celtic two, Hibs nil. McLeod and, Mc, and McStay. Um, 16,000 there at Celtic Park. It's changed days indeed. Dundee United 3, St Mirren 0. Um, Paul Sturrock with 2 and Ralph Mount with 1. Any names you want to pick out from any of those? Uh, we're just, just looking at them, especially sort of the Aberdeen Rangers, Celtic, Dundee United, man, look at that side. Mm. Incredible side, isn't it? Yeah. Only 6,800, 6, eh? Yeah. Well, I mean... I've mentioned this before. I mean, certainly Rangers and Celtic went through a spell where it wasn't great crowds they were getting, um, but they were probably about the sixteen thousand up to twenty thousand. But the smaller clubs, and I say the small, you know, with you know, without being too disrespectful, they were getting four thousand, five thousand, which they would absolutely grab you, you know, grab yeah. those sort of um, crowds today. Um, but you're right. You probably at the time down United, you maybe think that was they should be getting double that. So Mirren were a good team then as well. So you yeah, but I'm have... saying Billy Stark and Frank McAvenny, aye. Yeah. Billy Thompson. Yeah. Oh, oh, we can't we can't go past it without mentioning the Clyde Bank two 0 win against Queens Park. Bobby Williamson with two goals and a massive. Leave Bobby Williamson, Kilmarnock manager. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Former Kilmarnock manager. Oh. Yeah. I, I tell the story of. Um, so Tom, Tom and I are Clyde Bank supporters, as, as you probably probably have heard yeah. over the years. Oh, yeah. But um, the, I tell the story of me 
it was a warm up at Clydebank and it was Tommy Coyne and Bobby Williamson who oh, were yeah. they, 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 that was their strike force at the time and um, they were warming up hitting balls into the net and I jumped on and and punched one of them away and saved it and they absolutely tore into me for it and it was just like <laughs> absolutely wrecked me absolutely wrecked me I thought I've just saved I, I, the ball in, you, know, you know we're talking about the, the concussions before I, I just, that's just reminded me when I was uh, it must have been just after about 1985 maybe a bit later mm. remember Ian Wallace yeah 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 Ian Wallace was at Sunderland and he couldn't hit a barn door. And I, I remember he, the ball was swung at the far post and he's, he's caught clean the volley in the, in the, in the forward ends behind one of the goals. A bit like, yeah, what would be Sunderland's cop end? He's have the barriers. Now we're just sat in the barriers. It must be about seven or eight or something like that. Now he's a bit older. Yeah. And he just caught his flush square in the face. It was like you know, like when you you see like a, a parrot on a, on a perch and it just it gets hit, it gets swings round. <laughs> That's what I was like. Yeah. That's probably where the concussion started. Is, is that you just remembered I, it? Yeah, I, I tell you, I, I, I've done that a few times though. You know, when I've been what if I've especially if I've been sub and warming the other goalkeeper up and hitting people behind the, I think it down it's uh, the old Love Street. Remember um, striking a ball at Jim? We weren't away from the goal because we wouldn't have in the goal mouth. So he just put some cones at the side of the pitch and I've smashed one and it's went wide of Jim. And uh, there's a guy there with it. Uh, he's pushing somebody in a wheelchair. It was obviously like the little like sort of disabled sort of uh, part of the stand. And uh, oh, this, 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 I've hit this, this care, the guy who's caring for a disabled person square in the face and his glasses flew up in the air. And as I've walked up, as I've walked over to apologise, you can just see the blood sort of trickle oh. <laughs> down his face. Oh, man. Oh. I've done that a few times. It's your own fault. If anyone see my kicking, especially when I was younger, <laughs> then they could expect that sort of thing. Yeah. It always looks worse when the person doesn't expect it. You know, when oh. it takes them by surprise, that just looks as if it's, yeah, not seen it coming. <laughs> okay, let's move on back into the magazines here. So we're going to have a look at some it's worldwide so they look at what's happening in football worldwide and this one is newsflash an argentinian referee attacked it says the referee of a league match in argentina between independiente and sarriento was assaulted during the game by a linesman the referee failed to blow for offsides the linesman gave and finally he lost his temper and attacked the referee twice punching him in the face <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't. I can't claim to have ever seen that happen. Um, but that's that's taking it a bit far, if you ask me. I mean, if you're watching Argentinian football, that's what you pay your money for, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's all. That's all. Carry on. Yeah, there's there's got to be a betting market for things like that down there, isn't there? Absolutely. <laughs> Moving on. This is a special report on falling gates, and it's a final part. Um, so there must have been ones in the previous previous magazines, and it says. Blame Maggie Thatcher. Is it? I don't think we need to read anything else. We just blame Maggie Thatcher. Just... Yep, fine with that. Right, so it says, we all know there is something wrong with football. The stay away fans tell us that. But it is one thing knowing it and another to do something about it. In this special report, Shoot gets the views of a cross-section of soccer personalities who care deeply about the future of our national game. Now, the, the people that they do get um, opinions from is Jimmy Arfield, ex-England captain and now a journalist and broadcaster. Graham Kelly, Secretary of the Football League. Evelyn Hughes, ex-England captain and now player manager of Rotherham. Gordon Banks, ex-England goalkeeper. And Ted Croker, Secretary of the FA. So we'll, we'll quickly look to see what each of them say. So Jimmy Anfield first says, Improve facilities. Introduce a family card and look at the cost to fans. And he doesn't feel there's much of a problem on the pitch, but doesn't want it to get too soft. No, no real... Um, solution there. Graham Kelly says we will not be stampeded into panic everyone has their own ideas on the makeup of the league, TV coverage sponsorship etc. We may have to get used to the idea of clubs operating on smaller turnovers. Crowds may never rise again. Oh how wrong he was. Emlyn Hughes, next one Emlyn says the answer lies with the Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher. People won't come back to the game unless they can afford to. There are over 3 million unemployed and they just haven't got the money to be able to go to football twice a week. Yep, good shout there, Emlyn. Gordon Banks, the next one, uh, he says, There's no way people will go back to the game until they can feel safe. Hooliganism isn't the only problem, but it is the biggest one. 
Once we can offer a family nice seats at all our stadiums and safety as well as comfort, the problem will be gone. I'm not quite sure about that, but it's definitely on the road to that. And the last one, Ted Croker of the FA says, With the record number of affiliated clubs in the country, there are now more playing than watching. He says that this is a healthy sign and says, The game has never been stronger and I am extremely optimistic for its future. That's a suit man talking right there, isn't it? I mean, that's absolutely just the, the party line. Um, spin, spin, spin. What, what's your, what's your, what, what's your opinion on this? And I, I know uh, the, the hooliganism had a lot to do with it as well, you know. But I, I've always said, even since I started playing, football is much better now. Do you know? Think, mm. you know, like the, the actual game itself. Yeah. I know there's, there's there's a lot wrong with it still, but you know, but if you, want, if you go back and watch watch those games, especially before the back pass rule Oof. was yeah. outlawed, you know, do you know what I mean? It's some of those Liverpool games I've watched back when it's a bit tedious, you know, passing back when Brock Grubble are in two minutes late, you know. I think it's a big part of it as well. I've said I've said before that the back pass rule for me is the greatest introduction into football in my lifetime. It, it's, oh, without doubt. It's made the, the greatest um, impact on it. But I think I think there's, there's two different things, isn't there? That there's the game itself, so as a spectacle and as a sport and as all that, and then there is the enjoyment of the game as a as a social thing. I think that those two things are different. And I think you're absolutely right. The game is is improved, you know, by, a, you know, a large, a large amount. But I think maybe the, the idea of, and it's, it's maybe why, like, I enjoy, you know, the, the aspect of going to the, the, the Clyde Bank games and things, because it is more, it's, it's more of a social thing than, Aye. than, you know, it's, it's better being in that than it is, uh, just a number in a large crowd, you know, that the club yeah. doesn't really care that much for, if we're being honest. And it's, 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 oh, I th- they're still standing at those grounds as well, though, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that all leads to sort of co- like a communal thing, do you know what I mean? It's like it's it's, it's hard to bond with somebody who's six seats along the road from you, like, mm. you know what I mean? You know, you, you can't, you're not going to have any crack with them, are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is the thing. These kind of games, you, you can wander about and chat yeah. to somebody for 10 minutes and chat to somebody else for 10 minutes. And you come away having, you know, spoke to like a dozen folk through the course of the 90 oh. minutes kind of thing. You don't get that, sat in your seat at a big game. No, exactly. Uh, that's definitely changed. I mean, it, of course, you're, all, all stadiums, of course, are all safer and it's, it's a lot nicer experience sort of from that point of view. But there is... Uh, I still have a lot of nostalgia for going go, going to rock the park when I was a kid. You know, with me, I used to go a lot with me because my dad was working a lot. He used to go with me mate and and his dad, and it used to be brilliant. You know, you look back at them really fun times. Like, you know, even just walking to and from the stadium, like you know, mm. I mean, I, I, even if I go to some games now, I'm not, I normally just walk from my dad. It's not it's normally about an half an hour, half an hour walk rather than driving there and park my car. Quite like quite like going going to games that way. Yeah. I, I don't know if I mean talking about the social aspect. I, I don't know if that really would work nowadays with the the bigger teams, to with with such a crowd. Because I mean, it's like so, say with Tom, we can go for a drink beforehand. But if you have, you know, the pubs just down from the 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 ground. But if you have forty fifty thousand people, that's not going to happen in the vicinity of the ground, is it? No, exactly. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. But I, I think you you make a good a good point there about the the standing i think they, they've got to start introducing more of this safe safe standing it's like the the all seated was absolutely required it, it was absolutely needed especially in england and british football in general but um i yeah. think it's it's i'm not saying it served its time we need to get rid of it but i think it's served its time in terms of getting to football to a stage now where okay we're a lot more responsible um or we should be a lot more responsible so let's start bringing and we we need to do it quicker. Let's start bringing back the safe yeah. standing and and try and make it more of a a place that people can actually experience it the, to a degree the way that we used to. If Celtic still got it, did they trial it for a while? I think they've still got it, Tom. Have they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. still got it. Yeah, and you know, I, I I haven't I haven't seen a single negative thing. I mean, I know that I've been looking hard enough, I suppose, for 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 negatives, but I haven't seen anything that. It, let's face it, if there was negativity around it, it would have been, especially, you know, we know one side of um, Glasgow would be absolutely piling on it if there was something 
not right about it at Celtic Park. So I think we would have heard about it. If you if you look over in Sweden, where I've just been, that like there's um, a couple of clubs share a stadium called the Telly Two uh, Arena. It's um, Joe Gordon and Hammerby, and it's twenty five thousand all seated. It's like absolutely space age roof on. It's um, it's absolutely beautiful, like you know. But they still have they get, they've got like a facility where they can put seats in behind the uh, behind the goals, or say like you know normally if it's a like Joe Gordon at home, they have the left hand side, Hamby at home, they're on the other side. But they do just have just a, a facility, just have a stand in the whole sa- stand, just a, a stand in section, hmm. and they've still got that. Yeah. So it's it's not like it's un- undoable, like you know. Hmm. I mean, it's. I don't think we certainly wouldn't want to get back to these scenes, but there's there's nothing there's nothing like watching an old game of football when a goal goes in, you just see the whole crowd. It's about a wave thing. I mean, which is exactly the sort of thing we don't want to happen. But how great a sight was that when you know you just see a whole cop just all moving down to the front and yeah, swarming there. Mm, brilliant. Okay, let's move on to next page is another advert, and this is Score With This Great Football from Dane Pack. So it says, you and your friends can have an 18-panel regulation weight vinyl football free in return for 50 front panels. I love I love when they do that. You can have this for free, but you got to give us 50 front panels from the Dane Pack, 200 gram packs. Um, or you can buy one straight away for £1.99 plus three front panels. So you've... So even if you want to buy one, you've still got to get some bacon. You've still got to get at least three packets of bacon. Yeah, I've got a bit of I've got a bit of useless information for you. <laughs> so in, in in Denmark, they normally just have streaky bacon, mm. but like the the back bacon, like we have, they call it English bacon. Mm-hmm. Now we call it Danish bacon, don't we? Because mm. it, it does come from Denmark, but they call that English bacon. Yeah. There we go. What? <laughs> yeah, you, 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 did you say it was going to be interesting information or just information <laughs> <laughs> okay so Morton so we're on a Morton team group here and straight away I mean you can see that they've done it with Tony Higgins with a Panini sticker stuck on here and Tony Higgins is there with his uh, Partick Thistle strip on So, but this one they've actually cut out the, the badge of Partick Thistle and the bit where it says Partick Thistle so they've made a bit of an effort here so the Morton team group here, again, I keep going on about it, and, uh, you know, the strip is just classic Morton. Blue and white stripes, or hoops. Um, Umbro, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And um, there's a few, I think Benny Slavin is down there, is Benny Slavin, so I, I think that they've, they've um, got that wrong in there. But um, again, the, the goalkeeper who is um, Roy Baines, who's an English goalkeeper, but he's not that tall. I don't know what height he is, but... Um, He's probably the smallest person in the in the squad. I think he, he Roy, it rings a bell. I'm sure he was coaching up in Scotland when I was there. Yeah, he, he had the Smorton, Celtic, and St Johnston is where he's played. Um, he's from Derby, but he spent I think he spent all his career in Scotland. Um, we've got Jim McLaughlin who was at Chelsea as well. Yeah. Um, Clyde Bank at the end of his career as well. Falkirk Hibs. Um, who else have we got? Bernie Slavin, as we say, who went down to Middlesbrough. Um, Jim for Duffy D- with hair. Jim Duffy with hair, yeah. yeah. Who else we got? We've got David Hayes, who was always um, so he was in quite a lot in the magazines doing articles and so. I always thought it was a a strange choice of a, a regular contributor to the magazines was was David Hay, and I've heard a rumor that it was some family member who was in the magazine. And I don't know how true that is. I'm sure I could be corrected um, with that. The the balls the balls look like those Telstar balls actually I've just noticed yeah. those they look like the Telstar balls from the so the select I think they're Danish select are they they, uh, they, they play with the balls those balls in Sweden yeah good balls yeah black black and white football boots yeah, there we go those were the days sitting on a school bench as well those were the days for the team photos I tell you what a little tip from when I used to do um. Uh, team photos. If you if you ever look at if you ever see any of the ones that I was in, I was always on my tiptoes, <laughs> just to, just to make myself a little bit bigger than the the keeper next to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. I, I can't believe I've not mentioned Andy Ritchie there, um, who yeah, is okay. an absolute club legend, club legend and a legend, and so right beside the goalkeeper. 
Um, so not 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 the the English Andy Ritchie, Scottish Andy oh, Ritchie. Oh right, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, played for. He started at Celtic. He, he did. He he did play, didn't he? Did yeah, he? yeah, he yeah. did play at Celtic. Hey. Um, uh, he was swapped for Roy Baines, uh, the goalkeeper. Hmm. Celtic uh, paid Morton money for Roy Baines and swapped him for Andy Ritchie, and then Baines went back to to Morton after that. So yeah, Jim Duffy, as we mentioned. Uh, Morton, Dundee, Partick Thistle managed at Falkirk, Dundee, Hibs, Brecon, Clyde, Morton, and he was currently at Dumbarton. Is he I still, still Dumbarton? Still Dumbarton? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else we recognise in there? Not for mine. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So, so we'll, we'll look at the back page here. So we're on a super focus with Nigel Callahan of Watford, and we'll just have a wee look through some of his. Um, let's see. Well, he's, he's, that picture there, he's playing against Sunderland there. That's a Sunderland away strip there. Oh, it is. That's, that was a nice strip, that one, yeah. yeah. I mean, that looks like Ian Monroe in the background, does it? Yeah, yeah it looks like, look like him, actually, yeah. yeah. There was a, a pro- programme about 20 years ago on Sky, a beat on cover, but it was going back behind the scenes with all, like, the, uh, all the reps and everything like that. And I'm mm. sure he was DJing out in the, in the beat there. Right. And he was absolutely absolutely massive. I mean, he, he was a young slip of a thing, that, like little little tricky winger. Yeah. He absolutely ballooned when he finished playing. Mm. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Well, let's... let's... Anybody want to pick out any of his um, nickname, Cali or Nuggethead? Nuggethead. <laughs> We've got favourite newspaper, son. Mm. Okay. Um, favourite other team, I don't have one. That's a get out for me. Car Fiesta Supersport. I've no idea what that is, but it sounds like a right boy racer sort of car. Um, let's see what else we've got. Most memorable, memorable match, beating Wrexham last season to clinch promotion. Uh, best stadium played in Villa. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, he's he's, he's done it, isn't he? Food and drink, steak and chips, and lager and lime. That's oh, that's that's perfect. That's perfect. Honestly, the like the lager and lime, I absolutely get because it's it's a great drink to have after a, a game of football or something like that. I just think it's really refreshing. But there we go. That's me. Uh, so if not a player, what job would you what job would you do? And he says this jockey. jockey. Uh, there we go. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Like you did. Who would you most like to meet? Uh, Suzanne Dando, TV spe- sports personality. Yep. I think, um, and, and was Andy Gray married to her or were they just seeing each other? Suzanne Dando? Or am I making that up? That ring, that ring, no, no, it rings a bell, that. Mm-hmm. It does ring a bell. So what else have we got? Superstitions. Always eat crab on a Friday night and go out on the pitch third. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crab on the Friday? <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe maybe he's Catholic and he only eat, um, don't, doesn't eat meat on a Friday. Maybe that's what that is. It's fish day. Um, biggest influence on my career, my dad in my early days and all the coaching staff I've trained in. That could be your your answer to your question, isn't it? Um, your dad and then your coaching staff. It's going to be nice to look at his, his best ever all-time 11. So it's Shelton, Carlos Alberto, Beckenbauer, Moore, Jr., Bobby Charlton, Maradona, Falcao, Pele, Puskas and Zico. It's quite That's an, an attack in the yeah, I was just thinking that, yeah. Is <laughs> uh, Bobby Charlton playing as a sort as a holding midfield, hold midfielder? Uh, Maradona, Falco, Kelly, just get sequel. Uh. Mm, brilliant. Okay, so so we've got the end of the magazine, and thank you, David, for that. So, what's what's going on in your life at the moment? I know there's been a, a change recently. So, what's happening with yourself? Yeah, so I, I just I, it was I think two weeks ago that. I, uh, I left the uh, Austin Sons to come back and um, yeah, just it's been a difficult time. Sort of my family and sort of my daughter and it seems a bit um, a bit selfish to to stay out in Sweden and and not be here for them. Like you know, mm. and it's been more incre- like I said before about flying back. It's been increasingly difficult to come back. So it's yeah, it, I thought I just I, I've done enough time out in uh, in Sweden and, and decided to come back. So just um, yeah, putting some feelers out now just to. Uh, to wait and see what the next thing is, what I'm going to be doing. But it's nice. It's just nice to be back after being away for so long, you know. Mm. So, what about the things like writing and stuff? I, I know you do a lot of journalism and articles and things, and yeah, the, the the darling of the podcast world is um, <laughs> Billy Collin would probably put it. But have you got any thoughts of writing a book or anything like that? Yeah, well, I mean, be, be, before I went out to Sweden, I I got approached to 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 write a book, and it was. It is something I've thought about for a long time, you know, and um, I got approached by a, a, an agent said that, you know, that a, uh, a publishing company were interested in taking a book and I had to do like a, a yeah, sort of, I can't remember what it's called. Be writing a book anyways. Yeah, treatment. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 
we're doing a treatment for it and I did that and all got accepted. And then, then that, that's when I moved out there to, to Sweden to work over there. So it came a bit difficult, you know, but as much as I love writing, it's in, it, it's quite, I find it quite intimidating just to, you know, to think to write 80,000 words where I've probably, you know, in all the pieces that I've wrote for, for everybody over the last sort of 10 years, I've probably you know, written 10 times as much as that, like, you know, but to do it all in one chunk and, and all about myself. And, and it, mm. there, is a, there is a bit of thing about Christ who wants to listen about what I've got a rabbit on about, you know, at least, at least when I'm writing about goalkeepers and things, it's of interest to other people because it's about other goalkeepers, like, you know, but yeah, it's something I'll, I'm, I'm, I will be getting back into uh, in the meantime, you know, uh, I've, I've missed it actually, mm. you know, whereas I, I still have written some pieces for the times and that while I've been aware and, I haven't been doing the column for Sun and Deco because you know when when the pandemic started, you know they they furloughed a lot of people and, yeah. and, and got rid of all like the the columnists that the, the Sun Deco. So I've not I've not done that for 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 six months now. So you get out, you do get out of the the habit and the, the out of the, the routine, but you know. So I'm hoping to to start that up again and, and get ranked. I absolutely love it. Hey, so listen, you know I, I wish you the best um, and. I'm sure something will come your way very, very soon because you're great at what you do, I think. So uh, good luck just, with that. Just talking uh, there, sorry, David, a bit about other uh, goalkeepers. What's your your the number one sort of pet hate about what uh, commentators criticise goalkeepers for? Do you know what? In the minute, it's absolutely everything. <laughs> you know, because because uh, um, it, since sort of like the, the last few years and... Obviously, I've been pushing about sort of trying to get more understanding about the position and sort of, and I, and I see about getting more goalkeeping analysts on TV or goalkeeper specialists. Me, I always mean me. I don't want anybody to be ambiguous about it. I mean, me, to get me on the TV. I mean, I don't know if you picked up on my sort of really intense en- envy that I was uh, emitting on Twitter last weekend when Rob Green was on there. Uh, was on Monday Night Football, but anyway. I've gotten over that now. I've, <laughs> I've, calmed, I've, calmed, I've calmed down now. But um, yeah, so it, it, it's so when now there's commentators and outfield players because they think that they have to do more to to analyse goalkeepers, it just ends up becoming criticisms. Mm-hmm. So in that, that's what the way they see analysis. That, that it's like, oh, I definitely should be saving that. I should be doing this or or whatever. Like you know. When really, a, at the minute, there's a big pet hate about you know when because teams play a lot of inverted wingers where they're coming inside on their strong foot, and then they come in and instead of bending the rope ball around the keeper, they sort of whip it inside and they are post. And and people don't realise how hard it is when the ball's moving across and you're actually moving across and they put it back across you. How difficult it is to get down again? You know, to shift your body weight to get back down. There's been loads of little incidents of that were called Darlo and Nick Pope in the last few weeks. And people are saying, oh, I should never be getting done now, like, you know, and it's, don't realise how difficult it is, you know. Now, I think people forget that, that, you know, what from what we've been talking about, uh, you know, sort of like in the, what people our age see of like the glory days or like the look back at rose tinted glasses where they say, oh, this goalkeeper was phenomenal. He, it's because now you're only, ever, a lot of time you only see the good saves that they made. You didn't see them week in, week out, yeah. sort of m- making all the mistakes that they used to make and, and it, and it's you know it, it, maybe it's made a rod from your own back where it, it becomes the scrutiny on the goalkeepers come that much that you know you think that people are just criticising them all the time but yeah I, th- I think that, that that's the, the biggest bugbear I got the minute that they feel like they're analysing goalkeepers just because they're criticising them like you know mm. I, th- I think the important thing is that you're you're not saying look keepers shouldn't be criticised they're not perfect but at least try and figure out what went on and the example that I that I found really interesting was a, a tweeted, I think somebody already sent it to you, the one the other day where the keeper just for a fraction of a second and it's yeah. like it's so difficult to see that happen, that you, you first thing you think, how how has he been beaten like that why, why is he not just standing up and and as soon as you see that it, you then start asking the question so why, why is he why was he looking at the guy? And as you said, maybe he was expecting the player to miss it and to go into the next one. Well, well, I said, I mean, I think it was probably about two years ago. David De Gea made a great save from a header. I think it was against Sevilla. And as the balls come across, he stopped looking at the ball and looks at the man. And then, and, 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 and it, 
enables him to look at the player and sort of get some sort of uh, cues mm. from where he might be heading the ball and then he can react. Where in a, in a short space of time, so it's close at the goal, the, the ball's coming quicker. He's trying to do that. And like you said, he's just not seen Simon Kerr coming across the near post and getting that header at him, like, you know. Mm. And it is, it's... You're right. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that's you know that every. I'm not saying that everything I say is right either. It's just it's just what I see. But also about about that, it is about sort of okay. It's I'm not saying it's not a mistake, but this this and this. Mm. You know what I mean? This has happened, so you've got to take this into account as well. Great stuff. Listen, thank you very much, David. It's, it's been a long time coming. This I've been hounding you for a long, long time. So I'm very glad that I've worn you down eventually. Um, but thank thank you for joining us. Um, when we do the show, there'll be a, a web page with it that goes with it where we will put all the stuff that we've been speaking about, any videos of things that maybe we've been speaking about, and I'll link to anything. So I'll be in touch with you and see anything you want to link to websites or things like that as well. Um, I know, bother me. Just just send it to me and I'll, I'll get it up. Great stuff. But it's it, it, I've really enjoyed it, mate. It's been absolutely brilliant. Good Brilliant. crack. Brilliant. Thank you again. Thank yeah, you for coming you. on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you, Tom, for being Tom. Thank you, Andy. And thanks to everyone for listening to the podcast. Please continue to follow us, download it, check out the website, check out our charity partner, which is Western Bartonshire Community Food Share. Um, and basically, you know, give us some feedback, get involved. Until the next time, let's shoot the breeze. <laughs>